Um, the topic today is, what computing devices should I be using? What we do as a committee is we find ourselves talking to each other about various topics, and then we say, well, if we're interested in it, then maybe others are interested in it too. And so this is one of the things that we've been talking about. Do we need to keep our desktop? Should we just have a tablet? What about our phone? Can it do everything for us? So that's uh, what Orv is going to help us figure out today. So uh, what we're going to do is Orv will do his presentation, and then we'll have a series of questions. And he'll have a couple questions for you as well. So here's Orv Giordo. Well, thank you, Kathy. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you here. So the short answer to the question is, it depends. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's lots of variables that go into trying to decide uh, what kind of computing device you should be using. What do you want to do with it? What particular software, if any, do you uh, absolutely require to be used? Uh, what's your personal level of technical expertise? And what's your ability to actually maintain the computer that, that you would buy? Because uh, maintaining it is critical these days. And we'll get into that more later. And finally, where do you go to get your technical ex uh, uh, assistance? Do you have a grandson or a son or daughter or whatever that you can say, hey, I need a, some help over here? If not, uh, uh, there are online resources uh, and telephone support centers, both at Apple and Google and so forth. Uh, so. Uh, so let's begin by looking at the choices. So you have the all-in-one desktop computers. Everything, the CPU, the disk drive, uh, the memory, uh, the graphics cards, everything that goes into a computer pretty much, except for the keyboard and, and pointer device, is built into the backside of the monitor. Very nice systems. Uh, th because there's no ugly cables. So let's keep going. I'll talk more about them later. You have your standard desktop computers, uh, where you've got the, a couple of tower-type computers. And then nowadays, there are also some new entries in that the Intel NUC, st NUC NUC, stands for Next Unit of Computing, made by Intel. Uh, th th just a box. Uh, they, some, some, of, some models have a fan, some models don't, depending on how much power they, they consume and, and put out. <clears throat> uh, the nice thing is those mount on the back of, of a monitor if you want. And then you've also got the, the, these little boxes are called a Chrome box. They run the Chrome operating system, like a Chromebook, but they're not in a laptop format. So they're a good alternative if you have a need for a stationary computer somewhere, maybe a computer lab here at uh, Oakwood. Uh, quite a number of uses. They're cheap. They're like 180 bucks for the system, and you buy a 27-inch monitor for $150, and away you go. Then you have your standard laptop computers. These are computers. Uh, these are laptops that only open so far, maximum of 180 degrees. They don't go around, we'll talk about those in a minute. But you've got like the uh, Lenovo ThinkPad line, you've got the uh, Apple MacBook Pro, uh, you've got the, uh, an Asus Chromebook Flip, Chromebook laptops, and then you've got a Windows laptop, this one is an HP. So, wide variety to choose from, and there's a wide variety of uh, prices and quality of components. And typically, the cheaper the, the laptop, the lower the component quality. The, the, the super cheap ones, they, uh, the manufacturers, Dell, HP, Lenovo, just go out on the market and find the cheapest disk drives they can find, because they're building to a price point and it may vary month to month. And so the, uh, if you were a business trying to build or equip your enterprise with all the same laptops, you wouldn't choose a low-end product because the, the laptops you 
purchase. In fact, any computer you buy month one would be different from what you're buying in month two inside. They look, look the same on the outside, but the insides would be different. And so the, when you pay more for like the Dell Latitudes and the HP NV machines and the ThinkPad X1 Carbons and so forth, those are guaranteed to be top quality internal components. So it's what's inside the counts. Okay, then a uh, fairly recent entry is two-in-one laptops. These are devices that can function both as a standard laptop and a tablet. And the way they work <coughs> is uh, when you flip open the thing, you can take it all the way around, turn it into a tablet. And it's a touch screen. So you can use it purely as a tablet. In these cases, this is a, uh, a, a Chromebook laptop, and uh, it runs almost all the Android applications. So you can basically turn it into an Android tablet as well as a, a Chrome operating system laptop. <clears throat> so that's, that's the difference between a pure laptop and a two-in-one. Two-in-one, the hinges permit you to go all the way around. Uh, and also, so some devices, such as this one, come with a, a stylus, so you can actually use a pen to write on the screen. Very nice little accessory. Works very well on this one. Is that available with an Apple? No, Apple does not make two-in-ones, and Apple does not make touchscreen laptops. Sorry. Guess they don't want to encroach on the iPad market. <clears throat> then you have your tablet computers. Up here I'm showing uh, the uh, iPad on the Left side, uh, on the middle, is a uh, Amazon Fire tablet, and on the right is a uh, Samsung Tab S6, I think it is. Uh, that's the S6 is really a Cadillac uh, uh, tablet. It's phenomenal. Uh, you can get it with a, a keyboard case that uh, actually works pretty well. So I think most of you know what an iPad does, uh, so I won't dwell on it a whole lot. Uh, in, the, in the Android space, there's, there's lots of cheap tablets, but then what you're uh, usually uh, giving up is screen quality, screen brightness, uh, uh, CPU speed, things like that. Once again, if the, if the manufacturers start building for a price, they give up on component quality. And then, of course, smartphones. And I think most of you know what those are good for. Uh, here we have the uh, Samsung Galaxy S10, uh, iPhone 11, and, uh, and Google Pixel 3XL. <clears throat> so the uh, most common uses are camera. Uh, the smartphones have basically taken over the point-and-shoot camera market. They've killed off the uh, point-and-shoot cameras and driving navigation. I wouldn't be caught on the highway without my Google Nav working. Uh, and other, lots of other apps, just thousands and thousands of them. Okay, let's go into some of the pros and cons. On the all-in-one desktop computers, they're really neat looking, especially with some of the stands you get, the nice curved base and things like that. They look really cool. Great for a home office. Cons are that they're hard to repair. If, if something goes wrong inside, you, you're likely not to be able to repair it yourself. You have to take it somewhere no matter what, no matter how simple it is. Uh, there, there's oftentimes less customization opportunity. You may not be able to get exactly the, 
uh, the internal componentry that you would like to get if, if you go with an all-in-one model. And all the major operating systems are, uh, uh, the, uh, are available in the all-in-one market. You have the standard desktop computers. You've all been there, done that. Very customizable, lots of different options from a variety of vendors, HP, Lenovo, uh, Dell, Asus, Acer, on down the line. <clears throat> They're repairable. Typically, you get better performance on a desktop, both this and the all-in-ones, than a laptop. Uh, a laptop, what they typically do is have less capacity of bringing data off the hard drive into the CPU, into memory. It's called the internal bandwidth uh, of the machine. And so you can have two Intel Core i5 CPUs of the, of the same horsepower rating, one in a laptop and one in a desktop. The, the, the desktop machine will run circles around the laptop, simply because they, they have to design the laptop for mobility and not so much for high performance and battery life. <clears throat> so the, the cons are that it's limited mobility. You don't go and take it apart and move it across the room very easily. And you can also look cluttered if you don't try and dress up the cables a little bit. So. And then standard laptop computers, pros are mobility. You can take it with you on vacation or whatever. Uh, nowadays, the, most of them are starting to come out with USB-C connectors. Uh, some of you may not be aware of what USB-C devices look like. I wish I could show this better to you, but that's a, a USB-C connector is just round. You can plug it in either way. There's no up and down. It's very nice. And a lot of the computers these days only have like two USB-C ports. And you may look at that and say, how is that going to work? And the way it works is that you can get a little device like this, single connection into that laptop, and it's got on the front side a USB type A connector. It's got an HDMI video port on it. It's got a, uh, another USB-C uh, port for connecting your power supply to. Uh, it's got two SD card readers, uh, uh, a standard size and a micro SD card slot, and then two more USB-C type A connectors. What is this good for? Think of uh, a home office desk where you would have a full-size keyboard and a mouse <clears throat> wired. Uh, and you, you'd have an HDMI port to go to your 27-inch monitor. Uh, and then might, you might have an external hard drive. You'd want to plug into one of these USB 3 ports on this brick. If you want to go away uh, and take your, your laptop with you, one connector, just unplug, go. Just leave everything plugged in. When you come home, one plug in, boom, everything's there. Works extremely well. So if, if you want to be set up so that you can take, if you have a laptop or a two-in-one and want to go on a vacation trip or across town, whatever, and take your computer with you, very easy to do. When you come back, just one cable to plug in and boom, everything of your home desktop environment is working. And oh, by the way, doing that, you have two screens. You've got your laptop screen as well as the 27-inch or whatever size standard monitor you have. So that's what a lot of uh, the expandability has come to in, in the modern laptop and two-in-one computers these days. Just USB-C is so powerful and so versatile that that's the way they achieve even better functionality than we used to have when we had a, a video port on, right on the laptop and then another port for uh, the USB, A, and so forth. And so by getting, by going to just two USB-C ports on the computer itself, on the laptop or, or two-in-one, they can make them even thinner. 
because you don't have to account for the thickness of those connectors. And then you use a little device like this and boom, everything is still with you. So a device like this is like 30 bucks. So it doesn't break the bank. Okay, moving on, two-in-ones. You get a uh, laptop and tablet functionality. If you just open up like a regular laptop, you get keyboard and everything all uh, functional. You can turn it over, you got a full, uh, a big screen tablet. Very nice for watching movies and or reading a book. You know, uh, Amazon Kindle app on these things runs fine. And if, you're, if you have aging eyes, it's even better because you got a bigger screen than, than a standard Kindle device. Uh, of course, they're touch screen, and again, expandable by USB-C adapters like I just showed you. Uh, the cons are not very customizable. Uh, any one manufacturer may have two or three models of, of any one uh, design type probably varying the CPU and amount of RAM in them. Uh, uh, they are more prone to damage because anything that's mobile can be dropped and have some breaks to it. Keyboard quality can vary, and typically speaking, the cheaper the device, the poorer the, poorer the quality of the keyboard. Uh, available operating systems for two-in-ones is Windows and Chrome OS. Uh, Mac, Mac do, Apple doesn't produce two-in-ones. Moving on, tablet computers, light and mobile, you've got a touch screen. You can, uh, not everything works as well uh, for the USB-C adapters as it does with uh, the uh, laptops and uh, two-in-ones, uh, but you, you, you can, connect the HDMI port to a television or to a 27-inch monitor and show your tablet screen on that. <clears throat> uh, the, the weaknesses are either no keyboard or pretty lame keyboards. Uh, typically, they're in a keyboard case with almost zero keyboard key travel. So it's kind of like typing on a on a kitchen table. Uh, they're not very good for content creation. It's kind of hard to keep your hands like this typing on that small 11 inch wide keyboard for very long. Uh, not good for photos. Uh, yes, every once in a while you see someone with a 11 inch iPad up filling, t taking a, a photo with, a, with an iPad uh, not recommended. So, uh, available operating systems: iPad OS, Android, and Amazon Fire OS. Then, of course, smartphones. Uh, they're great for mobile type uses. Uh, still works as a phone, although telephone calling is probably one of the least frequent things done by smartphone users these days. <clears throat> they're okay for on-the-go content consumption. They're horrible for content creation. Don't even go there. Uh, and then once again, the keyboards are... Uh, never mind. Uh, available operating systems, iOS and Android. So, so how to choose? So first of all, you have to determine a device category that best describes your desired use. Do you want it to be fixed at home, always in a nice, comfortable chair, looking out over the nice scenery in your backyard or whatever? Or do you want to be more mobile? Are there certain must-absolutely-have apps? Maybe you've had them for years and you want to keep using them. Uh, Problem is that there's a lot of apps that are now going extinct because they have online versions, and the uh, the software publisher is not maintaining the app anymore. So much stuff is going online uh, since the advent of the, the HTML5 standard, where you can do basically everything 
through a web browser that you could do with a standard installed app on a, on a computer. Uh, lots of people have been going that route because they don't, you don't have to update it. You just keep your website updated and everybody in the world is up to date. Uh, another uh, decision point is some, work, some apps only work on one operating system. So that may drive your, uh, your decision as to what type of device you would want to use. Then you also need to honestly analyze what kind of computer user you are. Are you uh, uh, the type of person that religiously applies system updates within a week or two after the, uh, they're published? Or do you make a computer purchase much like you're buying a toaster oven? In other words, it sits in the corner, and when you want it, you fire it up and use it, and then you shut it down, or maybe you don't shut it down, maybe you sit, let it sit there and just run forever, uh, but you never update it. Uh, I would submit that you are the, uh, a threat to every other computer user in the world because those devices will get hacked, they will be found, and that computer will become a member of a botnet. A botnet is a uh, collection of computers that some nefarious organization has made some malware that goes out and finds these unpatched computers and then breaks into them uh, and plants code in them to do whatever that hosting organization wants to do. Common uses are uh, to do crypto mining, it's called, where they run algorithms to generate Bitcoin. It's becoming harder and harder and harder to do, but if you've got millions upon millions of computers doing that, you can make some pretty decent cash. So, and they're harvesting, they're stealing your electricity and the use of your computer, oftentimes without you ever knowing. And your computer just sitting there in the background. And they, they're, they're very good at hiding what they're doing. A lot of uh, uh, anti-malware products can't even detect them and so forth. Okay, I, I hit my punchline too early. Okay, here we go. So how many of you are actively looking or considering use of Windows computers? Three. Uh, pardon? For currently using them. That's not what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, are, are, you, are you considering leaving Windows or sticking with Windows no matter what? Because I, I have a video that I can show that t talks about the ramifications of, of unpatched Windows machines. We see that. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. By the way, the, uh, this gentleman is, is Steve Gibson, a um, uh, nationally renowned computer security expert who uh, uh, hosts a podcast every week that I listen to religiously. He's a great guy extremely intelligent uh, on all things computer related. So here goes. So more than two years ago, yes. after the event which briefly rocked the world and in which Mark, Marcus Hutchins inadvertently but fortuitously stalled the, this groundbreaking worm or earth-shaking worm, Sophos recently took a look at the state of the WannaCry worm today. Uh, we'd like to say that it's gone but not forgotten, but we can't, because it turns out it's not gone. Okay, so what happened? As we know, on May 12th of 2017, organizations across the world were attacked by what was then a new and unknown, very rapidly spreading piece of malware, which we now know as WannaCry. It's now considered one of the most widespread and notoriously destructive malware attacks in history, which was halted only when out of research curiosity, Marcus 
registered a domain name that he found embedded in the malware, which unexpectedly and happily acted as its kill switch. But the kill switch didn't completely kill it. And today, more than two years later, WannaCry continues to adversely affect thousands of computers worldwide, although it doesn't get any press attention, and we'll explain why. Um, in fact, it's joined the legions of worms. We know their names, Code Red, Nimda, MS Blast, which continue to contribute to constant internet packet noise, for which I long ago ter coined the term internet background radiation. You know, it's just like if you put a, a system on the net, packets start coming in that you didn't ask for. It's just background radiation. It's these things that will never die that are still running on servers in obscure places. Uh, and then those machine, the machines haven't rebooted or the, the, the worms are written to uh, permanent storage and they arrange to restart after a reboot, whatever. But on that fateful day in May 2017, WannaCry stormed across the world. It was, as we know, made extremely prolific by its use of the eternal blue vulnerability and exploit, which was believed to have been stolen from the US NSA, the National Security Agency, by a group of hackers calling themselves the Shadow Brokers. And WannaCry provided another vivid example of the other thing we're often talking about, the so-called patch gap, which continues to exist today since the Windows flaw, which was exploited by Eternal Blue, had already been found, fixed, and patched in March of 2017's Patch Tuesday, a little more than two months before WannaCry's trans-internet rampage. If everyone had patched their Windows machines within those following two months, WannaCry would have never gotten a start. It, nothing would have happened. It would have knocked, but not been able to get in. It couldn't have propagated laterally across enterprises. It would have just been game over. But as it was, a great many Windows systems were behind on their patching. And believe it or not, they're still not patched today. So WannaCry entered into a target-rich environment and infected something like, it's, it's estimated, 200,000 victim machines in the blink of an eye. And as I said, not everyone is patched even now, more than two years later. And WannaCry is not only still alive and for reasons I'll explain in a minute, now ignoring the kill switch that was designed to stop it, but possibly more alive than ever. Okay, so what's with the original kill switch? Um, why was it there? Uh, unless the creators of WannaCry themselves explain their motivation, we'll never know for sure. But there are two prominent hypotheses. Either the attackers wanted to have, for some reason, a way to stop the attack at their discretion, or the more likely hypothesis is, it was a deliberate anti-sandbox evasion technique. Some sandbox environments fake responses from connections to URLs to make the malware that they're examining thinks, think that it is still connected and able to access the internet, when in fact, it's being deliberately prevented from doing so, so that it can't do any harm. Since the domain name was deliberately unregistered, the attackers knew that if a DNS lookup were to succeed, it could only have been because the malware was under analysis in a sandbox designed to make it think that it's on the internet, thus positively responding to any DNS query. So then the malware would end the attack to hide its true nature. If this was the motivation for the kill switch, this meant that Marcus's actions effectively turned the entire world into a sandbox 
and shut down the worms spread globally. And uh, it's been a long time since, since we've talked about this, two years. But the domain name was looked like the bad guys just like pounded on the keyboard. I mean, there's like, in fact, it literally looks like that. I see JAs occurring, J-A-E, J-A-P. So there's like some recurring letters. It's, you know, I-U-Q-E-R-F-S-O-D-P-9-I-F-J-A-P-O-S-D-F-J-H-G-O-S-U-R-I-F-F-A-E-W-R-W-E-R-W-E-A.com is the domain name. So, yeah, bang on the keyboard for a while. We don't have to worry about that being an actual, <laughs> an actual site. Marcus saw that in the code, registered that crazy domain name, shut the worm down. So, and as we know, if that was not done, WannaCry's payload would execute. It did execute uh, in 200,000 machines and would encrypt the files of the victim, then post the infamous extortion screen, which we showed at the time. I have it here uh, reproduced in the show notes. And I, and I, got a, I always got a kick out of it. The, the headline, it starts off with, oops, <laughs> as if this was a mistake. Oops, your files have been encrypted. Yeah, oops. And then it's got, remember, the, 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 the countdown meter over on the left showing uh, that the payment cost will be raised in and your files will be permanently lost within a week if you don't pay then they're not even going to bother to keep the encryption key and what they were asking for at the time it's kind of quaint now in today's numbers was please send us three hundred dollars worth of bitcoin to the following address and there were four addresses in the code that, that were that would surface um you know randomly uh that it would choose from anyway so back then the ransom was $300 to recover your files, presumably on a personal machine. Of course, now we know that 1.6 million was recently asked for the decryption of a, as a, of a sizable network. There are a couple of interesting notes about how WannaCry was portrayed at the time of its initial outbreak. For example, and our listeners will remember, despite the suggestions that it was unpatched Windows XP computers, primarily responsible for WannaCry's rapid spread. This mistake was due to the fact that some of the more high profile attacks were XP based. More than 97% of WannaCry detections at the time were actually coming from the newer Windows 7 operating system. It's also worth noting that while a computer patched against the eternal blue exploit is no longer vulnerable to being infected by a remote connection from another WannaCry infected computer. In, in other words, that was the way things were getting in was over the, the SMB, you know, file and printer sharing connection and port. If that computer the, the patched computer was infected before it was patched, it will still be trying to infect other computers. The anti-eternal blue patch only prevents the vulnerability from being exploited, not from exploiting others. And if nobody had since updated, if nobody had since updated WannaCry, that is, if it was the original WannaCry, that file that started spreading on May 12th of 2017 would be the same as the file seen in the wild today. But it turns out the reality is very different and much more intriguing. There's a new WannaCry. Sophos's research is based on a signature named CXMAL slash Wanna hyphen A, which is the detection name that identifies when a computer suddenly finds the WannaCry payload, which was a file named MSSECSVC.exe, so Microsoft Security Service, MSSECSVC.exe. 
svc.exe plopped into the c colon backslash windows directory. On a Sophos protected machine, the client application immediately, meaning the, the client AV, immediately blocks and removes any such file. This, using this detection data, Sophos has been able to see how many computers are being attacked repeatedly by other computers. That is causing new instances of that file to be dropped into the Windows directory as well as the file dropped during the attack. These infected machines could be on the same network as the ones being attacked or possibly anywhere in the world. All we really know about the infected machines that attempt to spread the infection is that they don't have a working AV on them, because certainly by now all AV has been updated to detect WannaCry. Otherwise, they would have stopped WannaCry and would not be attempting to infect other machines. In the three-month period from October 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018, so right, the last, the last quarter of last year, Sophos logged, get this, five million 140,172 detections of CXMAL hyphen WANA A, nearly two years after the original attack, as nearly every machine that can install the Eternal Blue patch has already done so. Why are there so many detections? Yeah, good question. As a sanity check, since the data was nearly a year old, Sophos just in August, two months ago, re-ran their queries looking at just one month of attack data, August 2019. They discovered that in that month alone, they had recorded more than 4.3 million attacks against their customers' machines. That seems like a significant increase, but those numbers can be misleading because the data is based on customer machine feedback and the number of customer reports changes over time as the size of their customer base changes, presumably increasing as they're growing. So that can make the problem seem like it's getting worse when in fact it is uniform. Uh, what was important to note is that the proportion of the total number of attacks targeting Sophos customers in specific countries remain consistent in the data from 2018 and now this recent data in 2019 with the machines in the U.S. topping the list of countries most subjected to failed attempts at WannaCry infections. The fact that WannaCry is still going at all raises some interesting questions. Are all these machines really still not patched? Why is the kill switch not preventing the infected computers from, from trying to attack others, as indeed they are? Why is no one complaining about files being encrypted? So Sophos knew the answer to the first question already. That is, are all these machines really still not patched? This CX Mal Wana A detection is only possible on unpatched machines. To be sure of this, they investigated a random selection of computers to manually verify that they had indeed not been patched against Eternal Blue or anything else in the last two years. And that is the case. <laughs> the, even though Sophos's AV is on those machines, they are never being updated for more than two years. To answer question two, why is the kill switch not preventing the infected computers from trying to attack others? Because that's what it's designed to do. They know the computers reporting the detections have internet access because that's how they obtain their data. 
since those machines are most likely being attacked by infected computers on the same network, it seems likely that those attacking machines would also have internet access. So why isn't the kill switch stopping them? Analyzing th those 5.1 million <coughs> detections over last year's three month period from October 1st through December 31st, they discovered something unexpected. The malicious file being dropped on these computers was not the original WannaCry MS SEC SVC.exe file. In fact, among the 5.1 million detections, they identified <laughs> 12,481 unique files. But, but you, you get the idea that it's, uh, the whole thing is caused by people not maintaining their computers. Well, if, if you're using Windows and your computer shuts down, it's telling you it's updating Windows, is that updating it or patching it? Uh, yes. My computer keeps doing that. And right. it's it, when you're it may. To do something it, it, it may. It shuts down. It, it may be Windows 10 now, by now, true? Is it Windows 10 you're using, or Windows 7? I think it's 7. So, okay, but you have it set for automatic updates. A lot of people don't even go in and set it to automatic update. Oh, somebody else has set it up for me. Yeah, okay, but there's a lot of machines that the updating process has never been touched. And so that's how massive things like this can happen. And it's not just home users. I mean, just in the last month, there have been, I think, what are here, 14 school districts in Texas that were hit with ransomware. Uh, and three hospital uh, systems, uh, uh, one hospital system may have three, four, or five hospitals. It's the city of Baltimore. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the ransom being demanded is oftentimes measured in the millions of dollars in Bitcoin, so it can't be tracked. But, but the, the idea is that, uh, that, I guess I should say the difficulty is that uh, Windows as an operating system has such a legacy that it has to drag along compatibility with old apps that are three, four, five, or more years old, that enterprises say, we've got to have this, we've got to have this. Uh, and so the attack surface within Windows is just extraordinarily huge. Uh, by attack surface I, mean, surface, I mean a part of Windows that hackers, black hats on the internet, can attack in order to gain entry into the system and take control of it. And it's simply because Windows is such an old operating system and they have such a legacy backlog they have to maintain, they're screwed. So if you think Macs are immune, think again. Uh, yes, there's, there's fewer infections as of 2017. There were about 450,000 uh, uh, malicious programs aimed, aimed at max versus 23 million for Windows. But that's still a lot. And the same problem exists, unpatched machines. The fundamental problem is anytime you have a computer system on which you can install something, install a program, that's the same thing that malware writers use to install their malware onto those systems. <clears throat> So the fundamental problem is, uh, what can you do to enable people to do what they want to do with it and do it safely, not by allowing them to install things into the system? <clears throat> so then the obvious choice boils down to Chrome OS, an operating system built by Google uh, from scratch to be fundamentally unhackable. <clears throat> it 
It started out in, I think, 2010 was when it started. And, and it used to be panned, saying that the only thing it was good for is if you were online all the time. Uh, and that has been changed, so now you can do a lot of stuff offline. But more importantly, even with whatever computers you're using nowadays, how many times do you actually use your computer when you're not online? Checking email, uh, looking at the web, doing something, more than likely you're online somehow. So the, uh, Google's uh, foresight in architecting Chrome OS this way proved to be a huge advantage. They also made it so that it's automatic updates. They download in the background. All you as a user see is a, a little uh, notification uh, in the lower right corner of the system tray saying, please restart the update. That's the sum total of the user interaction with updating. Uh, <clears throat> and it works very well. Uh, there's no chance that Chromebooks can become part of a botnet because software can't be installed the way it can on Windows and Macs. Uh, and so you won't have to pay a ransomware either like uh, like he was talking about with WannaCry. Makes you want to cry when you see the, the bill for the ransomware. Okay. Questions? We have um, mics on both sides. Kathy and Ann have kindly agreed to be microphone runners for us. And I'll do my best to answer questions. Don't uh, guarantee I have all the answers, but I'll give it my best shot. So my question was, I'm not familiar with the Chrome OS operating system, or uh -huh. the Chrome operating system. I, yeah. I've used Windows and I've used Mac. How, yeah. what's Chrome like? Is it easy to learn? Yes. Uh, in fact, there's not even a, a user manual per se on it. There's, there's tutorial videos on YouTube about it. It's, it's similar to, uh, uh, to Windows. I mean, you have a desktop. Obviously, you have Chrome web browser, just Chrome. Uh, uh, you have a taskbar down here to, to launch apps, very similar to, to Mac and Windows. You have a, a, file, uh, a files app, like Windows Explorer and, and the Finder app, where you can navigate your files uh, and copy and paste them. It's got access to Google Drive built right in, so you can expand your Google Drive, where you might want to store stuff uh, offline from your computer, so if your computer is lost or becomes inoperable, you're not out your files. So, uh, and then here is the, uh, the navigation, uh, I'm sorry, the, the notification panel here. Rain possible at 4.45, okay, we've got to be out of here by then. Uh, and then you have uh, the launcher icon on the far right, or far left over here. And if it's not in the quick thing, you can expand it up and see uh, all the different apps uh, that are available on this Chromebook. Uh, if, if you want to add something to it, you simply go to the Chrome Web Store. Uh, so I'm just going to do a search. Chrome Web Store. Uh, search the store for some particular title you're looking for, and off you go. Uh, and if you get another Chromebook, all your settings are maintained. You log on to your Google account, and down come all the apps. It's super simple. That sufficient answer for you? It's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, and like I say, there's, there's tutorials around. You do have to be a little bit careful about the tutorials you watch, because you could be watching a tutorial from 2012 and the Chrome operating system has evolved considerably since then, so you do have to pay attention to the dates. 
<clears throat> yeah, I've been a lifetime Windows user, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> if I uh, changed to Chrome, what would be the learning curve load? And can I? Probably about an hour. Pardon? Probably about an hour. The, the, your, your, first, your first task would be to watch maybe 15 or 20 minutes worth of tutorial videos on YouTube. Just go into YouTube, go to your web browser, and go type in youtube.com, search for Chromebook tutorial, and then take a gander through the list of 20, 30, or 40, however many they are, on YouTube, tutorials for Chromebooks. So I, mean, uh, I mean, put it this way, uh, I provide tech support for an elementary school, K through eight, and the kindergartners just take to Chromebooks just like that. So it's completely compatible with a Windows system? I wouldn't say completely compatible. It is an operating system, and all operating systems are similar to some degree. And so it's not foreign by any stretch. And it, uh, if you have a computer now, I would suggest you look at some of those videos before you go out and try and do a purchase of any kind. Uh, the, there, there are varying levels of quality and degree of, and depth on the, on the videos, but look at them. Go to Google's website itself on Intro to Chrome, the operating system. But it's, uh, it's the kind of a system where it's, it's not just kindergartners that are using it. Notre Dame University is standard on Chromebooks. There, there's, there's a lot of higher education institutions that are now standardizing on Chromebooks. One, because their price point is a lot better than Apple. And two, they're not subject to the infections that they've been struggling with all these years with Windows. Uh, over there. In the past, when I have uh, gotten a new computer, the, the Geek Squad has moved all my files from the old one to the new one, no mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm going to a non-Windows environment, will my old files like um, Excel and my family tree genealogy, will that transfer? Well, what you would need to do, well, the, the short answer is you could move all your files. That's not an issue. What you would do would just be on your current computer. You would, uh, if you don't already have it, you would set up a Google account and then uh, within that Google account, go to your Google Drive, uh, which, is the, which is Google's cloud file storage, if you will. It's basically your disk drive uh, on Google's servers. And it looks like it's your own. You, you copy files to it. You can manage them however you want. So, uh, and yes, you can open uh, Excel, Word, PowerPoint files, uh, either uh, by using the Google Docs apps, which are free, or you can uh, subscribe to Microsoft Office 365, uh, which costs you like, I think, $7 a month or so, and have the full Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, uh, either through a web browser, or you can install the, the uh, Office mobile apps, which are uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint for iOS and Android. So you, 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 can, you can get that functionality. Now your genealogy might be the, the deal breaker. Uh, what you need to do is to find out if the company that uh, produced the software for your genealogy app now has a website. There's lots of companies, like I said before, that are uh, providing the same functionality through a website that they used to provide through an installed app on a Windows machine. The, the companies are more and more wanting to get out of being hostage to just one, uh, one computer type. And they do that by just going to a standard web browser. And then it's a question of uh, would that website allow you to upload, import your current family tree structure to the website? So there, there, there'd be a, a lot of investigation that needs to go on there. 
And then the other question is, how long have you had your genealogy app on your current computer? A lot of years? Have you ever updated it? No. So then the question is, is the current version of that app that you would install on a new computer even compatible with the files that you currently have on your old computer? Because they, they may be two or three or four generations beyond that, and you might have trouble anyway. Sounds very complicated. Yeah, yeah that's Rob. If you lose your internet connectivity, what do you have with the Chromebook? <clears throat> yeah, there, are, there are lots of offline files. You can, you can use uh, uh, Google Docs, Google Sheets, and Google Slides in an offline mode, store stuff on the local storage, or on a thumb drive, or on an external hard drive if you want. Uh, you can do a lot uh, without being connected to the internet. But what you can't do, of course, is to receive emails that just came in because you don't have access to it. But uh, it's, it's a myth that a Chromebook becomes inoperable if you lose your internet connection. That's not true at all anymore. Two questions. As I understand it, if you use Google, your whole, every, every move you make, Google makes a record of. So they have your whole life. Well, that's, that, that you're talking about the smartphone business. You're not, they're, you're not talking about their Chrome OS stuff. They're, they're not tracking Chrome OS. A, a there's, there's no, there, there is no GPS receiver in Chrome, Chromebooks and Chrome boxes. I didn't mean physical move, every move you make on your computer. So well, in, if you have a Gmail account, then they will trace everything you do on the web. Yes, and, and that, that is if you uh, don't enable the do not track feature of the Chrome web browser. So that there's a way you can turn that off. And if you don't like that, you can install Firefox on a Chrome box, a Chromebook, and use Firefox, which does not track you. And then there's, there's the Brave browser, there's a Momentum browser, there's lots of options that don't involve a Google-crafted browser. So if you're suspicious about Google, uh, that's what you can do. Now that said, uh, <laughs> I watched a rather humorous uh, interview with a, with a guy that uh, said, I don't trust Google, I'm going to unplug from Google. Took him six months to do it, and when he finally achieved it, he said, this is not worth it. My life is so screwed up <laughs> from not having Google Maps, Google Calendar, Gmail, everything else. He finally concluded, I'll let Google have it. They haven't been hacked, and they're working very hard not to get hacked, and odds of them getting anything of value from me are somewhere between nil and none. So being afraid of Google, turns out is not all that critical. Okay, separate question. Does the Chromebook require you get that computer, or can you use an Apple computer? No. <clears throat> uh, Apple computers will only run Mac OS. You cannot install anything else on, a, on, a, on an Apple product. They, they have you hostage. Now, the other question is, can you install Chrome OS on a computer built for Windows? Uh, the short answer is no. Long answer is yes if you're very persistent and very smart. Don't think I qualify. <laughs> now, you're far better. I mean, if, if, uh, if uh, budget is a constraint, you, you can buy a, a pretty nice Chromebook for 250 bucks. Uh, and you can buy a Chrome box if you have a monitor at home you can buy a Chrome box for 180 bucks, give or take. That's the desktop version. So we're not talking high cost computing here, which is why a lot of schools are going to it. Uh, and and the schools are especially attracted to it, not because so much of the devices, but because of the back end management tools that Google has provided to schools and universities to manage entire fleets of devices. 
And uh, the, the, the little school that I provide support to has like 200 devices. And I would say I spend, I spend maybe one hour a month supporting it. It's tremendous. So the, it's not just the devices themselves, but it's the back office support where Google is just making it a hands-down winner, far superior to anything that Apple and Microsoft have done in the education market. Uh, right over here. Oh, uh, we got competing. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tag, you're it. I, so my quick question is, so if, you, if it can't be hacked, we don't have to worry about having any kind of a Norton antivirus or McCaffrey or anything like that installed on it as well? Correct. Okay, thank you. The, and, the, the, and the reason is that, number one, uh, the, the malware can't uh, gain a foothold on the machine. And in the event it did, uh, if, the, if the boot image of Chrome OS, the, that part of the system that, that first comes into action when you turn on, when you open up the Chromebook and it starts up, if that part of the code has been altered in any way, it alerts you saying, you're corrupt, reinstall the system. And reinstalling the system is, uh, is actually pretty easy to do. There's lots of tutorials online how to do it, but uh, <clears throat> it's not the disaster it is with Windows and Mac. Over here. Thanks. There's something wrong with a picture in my mind. If the generation and deployment of malware is illegal, why are we chasing ourselves around trying to develop ways to prevent it when somebody could be doing something about the source of the problem. The source of the problem is usually over in Ukraine or, uh, or Iran or places over which the U.S. has no control. And since the Internet is worldwide, uh, there are no constraints on it. All we can do as citizens is to have a very good firewall router at our perimeter, our connection to the Internet, and uh, uh, and use a, uh, a quality DNS, uh, like Quad9, uh, uh, to provide uh, the translation service between web addresses and the IP addresses. Uh, that process uh, can be used to actually block access to websites that are hosting malware. And that's what Quad9 does. Uh, and I think Cloudflare is starting to do that too. Quad9 is 9.9.9.9. .9 Google's DNS servers, sorry for the techie talk here, but uh, Google servers are 8.8.8.8 and 4.4.4.4. Uh, and Quad9 is four nines. And it's, it's sponsored by IBM and two other organizations. Uh, they, they support it out of their own generosity. They aren't charging for it, but they do a very good job of blocking access to sites that are hosting malware. But a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people just use their ISP DNS, and with that, you're toast. Mm -hmm. uh, right here. So well, I have a final question on cost. You said the mm -hmm. cost of a um, uh, Chromebook is about less than 500. How about a two-in-one? Uh, well, the, the cost in general varies from anywhere from, I'd say, uh, $180. If you go refurb, you can do $150 on up to $1,200, $1,500. Like if you go with, uh, uh, if you were to buy a uh, Google Pixel Book, it's called, which is a very high-end Chromebook with uh, top-notch screen, high-speed Intel CPU, uh, 16 gig of RAM, one terabyte hard drive, a keyboard that's that's a dream to type on. Uh, that's going to cost you anywhere from a thousand to dollars up. But you can buy like uh, this device right here. This is my daily driver. Uh, it's a it's a two-in-one uh, uh, Chromebook that's it's got an Intel CPU in it means it's very fast, but battery life kind of sucks because Intel is not very good at being power misers. So if you want long battery life, uh, get a what's called an ARM-based CPU. 
ARM. Uh, the, uh, it's the same kind of CPUs that are in smartphones. You may have, you may have seen advertisements for smartphones that have the, um, uh, what are them? Qualcomm 835 CPU or 845 or 855 CPUs. Those provide a lot of power, but they really are efficient on battery consumption. So if you need long life, you want to go with a non-Intel one. For me, I was, I was okay with having like five, six hours of battery life in this device. Uh, but, but also, this has a pretty hefty battery, so consequently it weighs a lot. Uh, this Samsung uh, uh, Chromebook Plus, great device. A little smaller screen, still a, 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 a two-in-one. Uh, this goes for about $450, uh, and it's much lighter. It's, uh, and uh, the, the only downside that I, f I find with this device and is that I got big paws and typing on this keyboard that's even this size is not my cup of tea. And the, the biggest nag for me is the backspace key up here is small. I'm used to having a backspace key that's got some size to it because I hit it a lot. <laughs> and uh, the Acer uh, Chromebook spin that I, that I have has a, has a real backspace key. This doesn't. This takes some getting used to. If you have smaller hands, smaller fingers, this might be a perfect device for you. Uh, the the uh, uh, Acer Chromebook Spin uh, 13 is about $715, I think. This is about $450. But these will last you a long time. Because uh, uh, the, the thing to remember is that uh, once you get them, outside of the externals and the, the physical componentry, when you fire it up, every Chromebook looks like every other Chromebook. Google is really good at maintaining the consistency across the entire line. Google, unlike Android, where uh, every manufacturer can kind of roll their own as far as Android is concerned, not so with Chrome OS devices. They're all alike. So if you've seen one and learned one, you're going to be able to run any Chrome OS device you want to. A uh, question, uh, going back to the question about do you need malware? Um, Correct. To, um, it, on the Chromebook. Mm -hmm. But if you switch, <clears throat> if, if you're using a telephone or a cell phone for, as a smartphone and you move programs back and forth or files back and forth, you still need to have it for your phone. Would that be right? No. No? Uh, nowadays, uh, Google does not recommend running third-party anti-malware at all. They have the, the Google Play Protect. They have uh, services running inside every Android phone that are always on the lookout for stuff. And it's the, the third-party anti-malware companies that try to spook you into thinking you need to buy their products to install on your Android phone. Wrong. You don't need to. Uh, 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 the, the experts uh, that, that I listen to are unanimous in that, uh, in that position, that the third-party stuff just provides an even larger attack surface by which malware can worm into your system. Thank you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and Apple phones are basically the same way. Uh, Apple doesn't provide the hooks to third-party uh, anti-malware authors to even install on, on iPhones, on iOS systems. Other questions? I'll ask one since I have the mic in my hand. We have certain privileges. I want to follow up on Ruben's question at the beginning. Many of us have lots of Word files. If we were to transfer those somehow to a Chromebook, is that a big hassle? No. <clears throat> you, you would, uh, on your existing Windows machine, you would open up your web browser, 
pointer to drive.google.com, log into your Google account, and just start dragging files from your, the Windows uh, Explorer window into the, the uh, browser window for Google Drive, and files will start uploading. That's all it takes. And the fact that they're in Word format is not an impediment, is that right? No. Well, uh, like for example, you can do one or two things. Let me sh see if I can find an example here. May not be able to on this particular. Maybe while Orv is looking, I can say, I do not have a Chromebook, but I've given up my um, Word application, and I'm now using Docs under Google for all of my word processing. So all of my word files are readable by Docs. And when I'm finished, if I'm sending it to somebody that has Word, I just download it as a Word doc, and it goes to them as a Word doc. If they're already using Docs as well, I just share it, and I don't actually have to send them a copy. So it's entirely possible to do, to not use the Word application anymore. I'm doing it on a Mac, but. Yeah, so right here, that line right there you see that I highlighted is a dot docx file. And if I do a two-finger tap, uh, that's the equivalent to a right mouse click. Because <clears throat> anytime you're dealing with a touchpad, you, you don't have a left mouse and a right mouse. So a, a one-finger tap is a left mouse click and a two-finger tap is a right mouse click. So, let's see. I'm not seeing... Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna copy this locally here. So I'm gonna do a copy, and go to my downloads folder, and paste. And now if I do a two-finger tap, I can do open with, and I can open up with Microsoft Word. <clears throat> this is the mobile version of Microsoft Word. But to use this, I do have to have an Office 365 account, which costs $7 a month. So that's why most people, after they take a look at Google Docs, Google Sheets, and Google Slides, say, screw Microsoft. I, what Google's got for free covers my needs. Uh, I would say, if I had to put a number on it, I would say that uh, Google Docs is what, about 90% of full Microsoft Word, give or take. I haven't run into anything that I'm missing yet. It's, it's, it's a little bit different interface, so you'll have a little bit of a learning curve, but once you learn how to word process in one word processor, going to another one is simply a matter of at first finding where in the menu structure it is and then for after, thereafter using it. And, and the really nice thing is that you can share the files real easily. So Lou, as you know, and Louise and I co-chair the, the technology committee, and as we're preparing agendas and notes, we just share our drafts with one another and then when it's done, we make it a Word <coughs> file and send it to the committee, so. Or, or better yet, make it a PDF. Or, yes, PDF, right, yeah. you can. Do many it, different kinds. It, just for those of you that know, it is not good form to share .doc, .excel, .ppt files in emails. Just save them as a PDF and send those out because that's the standard interchange format of the internet, of, of the internet these days. So. Other questions, right there. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of Apple products, mm -hmm. and I have music on them. Mm -hmm. Does music transfer? Uh, depends on how you purchased them. Uh, Kathy, you can probably address this better than I can. For iTunes, are you talking iTunes music? Uh, both iTunes and stuff I've loaded from my own CDs. Okay, if it's stuff you've loaded from your own CDs, that, that you could put on, on Google Drive, or uh, you could switch to Google Music or Spotify or any number of choices. You don't have to be hostage to Apple. What about the Apple Music? The Apple Music depends on 
uh, I think you may have to pay a small fee to gain the rights to take them offline, don't you? I don't know. Since I'm still using Apple, it's still working for me. Yeah. I don't know the answer. I, I think it's maybe a, a, a buck a song or something like that to be able to yank it away from Apple. So it's not going to be, you would want to keep your music with Apple if you have a lot of that stuff. Well, it just depends on how you listen to your music. I mean, the fact that you have a Chromebook doesn't necessarily mean you're going to give up an Apple smartphone, for example. Okay. So you, you might just use your smartphone or an iPad tablet to listen to your music. Okay. And did you say Google, uh, the uh, Chrome machines have a touchpad only? Well, the, uh, uh, the, none of the uh, modern devices have left and right multi clickable spots these days, if you look at them. Now, does that, that does not mean you can't plug in a full-size keyboard with a USB cable on it, or better yet, uh, get a, a wireless one that's got a little receiver on it, plug that into a USB port, and then you get both mouse and keyboard on it wirelessly through that interface. And you got to, then you do have the left and right mouse, whatever you, I personally am a fan of trackballs. So I just plug a track trackball in, works fine. Sure. So I, I have been happy for years using Do It for various pieces of information. Mm -hmm. If I were to use Chromebook, is there any issue with getting Do It feedback? On that no, the, well, you, you go to do it for tech support, right? Yes. Uh, I'm sure that they would provide support for, t for Chromebooks because Chromebooks have been gaining so much in popularity. They have to support them. Okay, thanks. And, and the beauty is that it doesn't matter which company makes them. Uh, oftentimes you have to, uh, with Windows machines, you have to worry about is it a Dell machine or an HP machine or a Lenovo machine because that impacts how things are done relative to how the hard drive is installed or how the memory is installed or all that sort of stuff. Not so much with Chromebooks. Okay, well, whoop, question one question. <clears throat> Gee, I thought track phones were for us tech retards. I've got my track phone turned off at the moment. Um, you said something about plugging your track phone in and... No, uh, no. track ball. That, that's, a, that's a kind of pointing device that's a mouse turned upside down. Oh, okay. Well, since we're on track phone, well, my, my track phone asks me in text, it says something about, uh, would you like to uh, text on web or something? I have no idea what they're talking about. Text on web? Yeah, it's that, just that, somehow, somehow like you're texting on a computer. Yeah, right. Uh, I thought you were going to text on a cell phone. But what that is, is um, uh, using Wi-Fi instead of a cellular connection for texting. And the way that works is uh, like this, uh, this icon right here. Uh, if I, now, if I open up my smartphone, go to Google Messages on my smartphone, which you can't see, but I, I go to the, the uh, options menu and say messages for web and read the barcode. Suddenly all, all my text messages are available and I, I can do text messages right from here. If I need to copy and paste from an email or something, boom, it's right there. So that's where messages for web Google Messages for Web is. And uh, Google is in the process of, of a new um, uh, feature set for text messaging called Rich Communication Services. Where, you know, right now, if you try and send a photo through text messages, it's oftentimes shrunk way down the quality, goes to heck in the handbasket and so forth. Not so with the new standard they're coming up with. And they're, they're, they're trying to make it a standard across all the different uh, cellular operators and so forth. 
So it's called RCS. Eventually it'll get here, but a lot of the uh, cellular services, Verizon, AT&T, and so forth, are so invested in their, their own text messaging service, it's going to take a while. But if TrackPhone is asking about messages for web, my guess is that that's probably what it's talking about. So then you have to find that standard logo that you see on your cell phone on a computer. Well, you install uh, 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 messages for web. Uh, you go to the Chrome Web Store and install the messages app. Uh, let me let me show you. So I'm going to go to the launcher. Now the launcher is only on Chromebook. Right. But then that's what we're talking about right now. We're dealing on a Chromebook. So, uh, and now we're going to go to messages. Uh, I'm going to it's, it's, it's several people right here. Are, are leaving. I just yeah. want to thank people for coming and thank Orv for giving us the useful information today. And Orv, will you stay a few more minutes, sure. maybe finish this answer, and I, then I, I, any other questions that people would like to ask. So thanks again. Thanks for coming. <laughs> So, to, to, to finish, yeah. So you'd install this on your Chromebook, and then you can synchronize between your Chromebook and your phone. Okay.